Good evening. Welcome to the Schomburg Center. It's a real pleasure and delight to have you here, Rachel, and to have all of you here. Uh, it's a lovely uh, summer evening, and I think it's getting hot out there. So um, brace yourselves for summer. It will now descend upon us. Uh, we've got a real special uh, treat in store for you. Um, uh, as you've probably read and heard in the recent news about this new book, American Tapestry, uh, we learn a lot about not only the First Lady, but also this country. And I think uh, I'm looking forward to hearing a lot more about the process of writing this book and some of the things that, uh, that Rachel would like to share with us that, that really animates something that we don't already know. So uh, to begin, I, I think um, what the audience probably doesn't know is that you had a lot of um, support. Um, kind of a community of behind-the-scenes players that contributed to this, uh, this, to this book, and um, starting with a, a genealogist, a certain institutions, a fellowship. So uh, maybe just to get started, talk a little bit about uh, the, the, the genealogy of the book itself um, and how we arrived at this amazing story. You know, I wrote a story in um, October of 2009 about the First Lady's family uh, with a colleague of mine, and that became the genesis of this book. Um, I'm a journalist. I, this is my first book, so this was a new experience for me. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and um, really, when I set out to do this, I kind of had this notion of, OK, I'm embarking on um, you know, a deep dive into the First Lady's family and into American history. And I knew it was gonna take some time. I knew I didn't have that much time. I was gonna do my best. I did get a lot of support, which was wonderful. Um, I took, in the end, two years uh, to report, research, and write the book. And I mean, there are so many people who helped me, um, several universities, Catholic University helped me. They gave me a research assistant and some office space. I have young children, office space was critical. <laughs> um, the Wilson Center in Washington, D.C., I live in Washington, D.C., also provided me uh, with space and support. Uh, the Fletcher Fellowship mm -hmm. kept me going when I was taking a little longer than I had hoped uh, toward the end. And then, really, I, I called upon experts in the field. I was doing something quite ambitious, taking her grandparents, the First Lady's grandparents, and taking them as far back as I could take them. So really, I was looking at very different periods in American history. And I reached out to the best experts in the field in each of those periods mm -hmm. to kind of point me in the right direction. Right. I, I wanted everyone to hear that because uh, First of all, it speaks to how important institutions are in supporting research and writing, that, that these books don't just come out of the imaginations um, of talented writers, that, that institutions like the Schomburg Center, um, as well as the Smithsonian. That's uh, that right, and I didn't, that's right. The Smithsonian also helped me. There were countless people, and it really, it made a big difference. And the, the Chicago Newberry Library as well. That's right, I did a lot of research there, and they were enormously helpful. There's one, uh, now, uh, Rachel knows, and I know that she didn't actually use the Schomburg, um, but I do want to make a shameless plug for it. Our, <laughs> Why not? <laughs> our, our senior researcher and uh, writer who introduced us, Christopher Moore, uh, wrote a book, and the title of which is Fighting for America, Black Soldiers, the Unsung Heroes uh, of World War II. And, uh, I'm letting you know, but also letting the audience know because it's in her uh, bibliography. So mm -hmm. we are represented uh, in this story. <laughs> you talked um, a little bit about the structure of the book, and I'm curious. It, it's a book that unfolds in reverse. Uh, the chronology begins with uh, the arrival of all four sets of Michelle Obama's grandparents, uh, and so it, it moves back in time. Tell us um, why you organized the book in that way. Um, uh, was it a, a marketing decision in terms of what the, uh, the reader might take um, as the most compelling aspect of this narrative before moving back to slavery? Why start with a reverse chronology? You know, when I started 
thinking about the structure of the book, it occurred to me that actually part of what I do is look, we're looking for the um, white ancestor hidden in her family tree, and as well the story of, of so many generations of people who emerged from slavery. And I thought to myself, we actually know where this story ends with Michelle Obama, you know, the first African American first lady in the White House. But the question is where it began. And I, it's a little unorthodox, and I didn't know really when I started doing it how well it would work, but I thought I would roll it back. Mm -hmm. And I also thought that um, because there was so much silence over the generations that kind of peeling back the layers and hearing what little bits and pieces people knew and what they didn't know, that that would give you a sense of just the reverberations that slavery had over time and um, that you would be kind of drawn to this beginning. Silence, I think that's, that's one of the most consistent themes in the book, the painfulness of this past. And it strikes me that the way in which you tell the story perhaps is your own way of um, easing the reader uh, into that moment, this moment of uh, Melvinia's terrible moment, this, this, this unfolding uh, legacy that begins with a slave girl, a six-year-old slave girl. Um, I was thinking about uh, the context and the timing of this work. So of course there is the first lady, uh, and that really speaks volumes to uh, why this book exists. But I also wondered if the work of Annette Gordon-Reed, the um, Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, An American Controversy, published in 1997, uh, the story of our, one of the founding fathers relationship with um, uh, his wife's cousin and his slave or enslaved mistress. I wondered if, if it were not for that work, would this have been a more difficult story to tell? Um, would it be harder for our collective imaginations to wrap our heads around um, the deeply significant fact of the melange of humanity represented by this uh, mixture of European, of African, of Native American? I think it was certainly helpful to me in the sense that there is a framework that people have in, in their heads about what this kind of situation might be like. Um, for Michelle Obama's family, it was quite different in a lot of ways. But I think, in some ways, the discussion has been ongoing. And I think that was a vital part of that. Yeah. So you, you've described this as a hard history. What do you mean by that? I think it's hard for people to talk about. I think it's the idea of a young girl, you know, maybe 14, 15, 16, being raped by her in the end, uh, someone in her owner's family. These are things that you know a lot of people don't really want to talk about or look at. And actually, in the research, it was quite clear to me that this extended both to whites and blacks. And mm -hmm. I think that sometimes people would rather look away. And um, in some of my conversations with descendants, white and black, it was it was interesting because even we in contemporary times, these are, you know, we're in the 21st century, these are people who know this history, we all do. But sitting side by side and having those conversations were not always easy. I remember one um, descendant of the slave owner who said to me, you know, in the end, this person decided that um, they didn't want to be identified in the book. And I said, you know, Mrs. Obama has said that she knows that uh, slave owners, the blood of slave owners and slaves runs through her veins, that she accepts that. And this person said, yes, but we were on the wrong side of history. She's not. And I think that it's, it seems like a long time ago. And it is, obviously, more than 140 years ago. But it's not that long ago. And not so long ago, in fact, because you were able to work with uh, two uh, 
cousins, two very distant cousins, one black woman.